Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to a wrap up for some unspecified amount of time since I did this last because even I can't remember how long it's been. Uh, despite how much I've been reading, I only have five things to talk about in this video because almost everything I'm reading right now is for my Hugo and Nebula Award winners project and I'll be talking about all of the award winners I read in November, nine or ten of them in separate wrap-up video, which I've already filmed, so you know it will be coming soon. First, I want to talk about Persuasion by Jane Austen. This is the fifth Austen novel I have read, and it's the one that I expected to dislike, and happily, I was more impressed by the novel version, the actual real story, um, and ended up liking it and very much enjoying the second half. I watched the 2007 movie version with Sally Hawkins uh, two or so years ago, and I didn't like it. I didn't care for the story. I didn't think it was romantic. I did not like the casting of the main characters. I thought they had no chemistry whatsoever, and it just didn't work for me. So I expected to not like this book, but actually I did enjoy it. It's not my favorite Austen novel. I think I probably enjoyed Northanger Abbey more than this, but at least it's been redeemed for me in some way. I feel bad for not loving it because I know a lot of people that I'm friends with on Goodreads seem to really love this. Like it's one of like, their favorite Austen novels and I'm just not one of you, I guess. The story is about Anne Elliot. She is 27 or so years old, so basically a spinster. Eight years prior, she was persuaded to refuse an offer of marriage from a man that she was quite in love with. And now he has returned. He is um, quite rich now and he's still single and she gets a second chance at love. So it's about a second opportunity for people to get together. I guess the story is actually quite appealing. When I say it like that, I think it's quite a sweet story. And I, I, like I said, I really enjoyed the second half of the novel where it feels like Anne has been brought to life a bit more. She's starting to stir and wake up inside. She realizes she wants him back and she's being a bit more proactive about attracting his attention and such. And I think that one of the most pivotal moments in the book is this letter that Wentworth, her love interest, writes to her. And it was, I thought it was actually really romantic and a really intense emotional part of the book, whereas it just didn't work for me at all in the movie. So I am very glad that I finally read it and I have reversed my opinion of the story somewhat, uh, but I am a little disappointed that it just isn't going to be my favorite thing by Austen. Next is Octavia E. Butler by Jerry Canavan. I got this book as an ARC from NetGalley, so thank you to NetGalley and the publisher. Um, I have wanted to read one of these Masters of Science Fiction books for a while. There's one out on Lois McMaster Bujold, there's a forthcoming one on Ian e M. Banks um, in 2017, and I would love to read both of those. So when I saw this one on Butler was available, I, I just wanted to try out the series, and I'm also interested in knowing more about Butler. I haven't read all of her work, I knew nothing about her life, and I wasn't afraid of being spoiled at all, so I just dove straight into this. This is like an overview, a kind of academic analytical overview of Butler's personal papers, which her entire library was donated and Canavan got access to. I think he's the first person to, to access it and read through all of her stuff, including like her diaries, her personal correspondence, and the many, many drafts and alternate versions of books that she had published or hadn't published. And actually, I think this ended up being just as much about the stories that she never wrote and that she never published versus the things that she did actually publish. I think there's a perception that Butler wasn't very prolific because I think she only had like nine published novels and maybe one book that she kind of disavowed. She didn't like it very much. But actually, she wrote a lot. She was always frantically, constantly writing and just very little of it seemed to meet her standards for what she wanted to write. It was just a really interesting look at kind of the inner life, the private life of a writer, the churn going on behind the scenes. This book is arranged chronologically, so in every section you have the major published work and unpublished work, as well as what was going on in her personal life. And arranged like that, you can really see 
um, her ideas developing over time and how eventually she didn't want to write certain stories because she thought she was repeating herself. She, in the latter part of her life before she died unexpectedly, she had a horrible long bout of writer's block and, and the trouble from that. So this does analyze all of her work and it completely spoils the ending for things, which I am not bothered by, but it's the only thing I would mention here that if you are really interested in Butler's work, if you haven't read all of her stuff and you're sensitive to spoilers, then you might not want to read this, but I'm pretty sure I will forget all of the that pertinent stuff by the time I actually get around to reading the books. and. I think for me, reading Butler isn't so much about being surprised by the endings, but trying to analyze what she's doing because her books are so dark. Two or three things I've read by Butler so far, I've been... I felt oddly about them sometimes by the problematic elements and having read Canavan's overview now, I understand why and that these were things that Butler acknowledged herself. So it'll be very interesting to read her other books now. Then I listened to the audiobook version of The History of the Ancient World from the Earliest Accounts to the Fall of Rome by Susan Wise Bauer. This audiobook is very long and it took me like three months to listen to it. Just little snippets here and there. It has quite short chapters so I could just pick it up in between things and listen to a little bit. I like ancient world history. It's the only type of history that I've ever been interested in studying and um, it's actually the problem here that this, um, the approach of, of Bauer's book is to rely on, his, uh, on the words of people themselves, but clearly in ancient history there aren't that many like first person sources or whatever. Just, that stuff doesn't survive so well. So it's a very high level history. It, it has to be. And history repeats itself. So it's basically this repetitious cycle of a civilization rises, a king comes to power, then there's a war, everybody dies, and it starts over again. <laughs> um, but mainly, I have studied this time period from, you know, ancient ancient history to the fall of Rome in elementary school, and then in high school, and then in college. And so very little of it was new. Like, I'm not sure I could recall these things at a drop of a hat if I wanted to, but listening to this audiobook, I was like, actually, I know this. This sounds really familiar. Um, so I'm not a super history buff, but I thought it was good for what it was, and probably would have been enriched more if I read the physical version and had access to more of the dates and the maps and such, which are supposed to be in that version, and instead I just, I just listened to the text. Next I listened to the audiobook of Lab Girl by Hope Jaren. This was narrated by Jaren herself, which was interesting. It is her memoir of being a female scientist. Um, kind of fighting back against sexism in the field, starting her own lab, um, the difficulties in kickstarting her career, funding issues, and also really fundamentally I think about finding herself and finding deep friendship and eventually love and a family of her own in her lab as a scientist. Uh, very much about how her life has become fulfilled despite all the odds being stacked against her. One of the things I love the most about this book is her friendship and working relationship with her like lab assistant named Bill. He is an eccentric character. Like l listen to this or read this memoir for the stuff about Bill and how they work together because wow. <laughs> I really enjoyed those parts. The only thing that kind of dipped my rating of this memoir is that while listening to it on audiobook, um, Jared isn't a professional narrator. She's a bit more monotonous, but I think it works because it is her voice. This is what she sounds like, and she's telling her story in her voice. But she does get quite emotional in some sections, and by the end of the book, there are some things she's talking about that I think that that like feel, hear, hearing the tears creeping into her voice and stuff pushed this into the maudlin territory. If I was reading it in print, it wouldn't have felt that way, but this combination of what she's saying and the way it was narrated just felt a little uncomfortable to listen to, I would say. So I would recommend this if you're interested in science memoirs. The final thing I have to talk about is Chasing Venus, The Race to Measure the Heavens by Andrea Wolf. My mom recommended this to me, and so I went straight to the library and I got the physical copy, but then I ended up listening to the entire thing on audiobook because I was doing other things. Um, it works both ways. I flipped through it quite a bit to see all the illustrations and pictures and stuff, which were very helpful, and I read some of the footnotes and stuff. 
This is about the two observations of the transit of Venus in 1761 and 1769, which allowed astronomers to make a much better measurement of the distance from the Earth to the Sun and therefore get a better idea of the scale of the solar system. Very interesting because back in the 1760s, it was really difficult to travel to the remotest areas of the planet and get the measurements they needed to figure out this distance. Um, so really this is structured following the major groups during both observations in these two years. Um, there was a lot of pressure for them to do these observations and get a result because the transit of Venus across the sun is a very rare event. I think it only happens like every 112 years or so. So they only had this one chance in their entire lifetime to do this. This was the first like international scale scientific astronomical event where people had to come together across boundaries, across borders, and during wartime, during the Seven Years' War, which I think was between France and Britain. And so you have astronomers who are trying to sail through contested waters and not get fired upon and stuff. People died for this. This also seems to be the birth of the time when heads of state realized that they could benefit from scientific explorations, that they could fund these things and scientific communities would get what they wanted, but nations could also reap the benefits, particularly in trade, getting better maps, you know, they, they're figuring out how to measure longitude and stuff. So I think this is just a whole turning point and I knew nothing about these events and how important the transit of Venus was during this time. So it was very interesting. The sad thing is that the transit of Venus happened like in 2012 or so, and it will never happen again in my lifetime. So now that I know this happens and how rare the event is, it's never gonna happen in my lifetime again. I'm not sure what else to say about it. I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought the audiobook was quite good. Uh, my mom said she really liked Wolf's writing, like her writing style is just very beautiful. It's very enjoyable to read. And I guess it is. I thought it was very um, easy to follow on the audiobook and she explains things very well, but I think I would have gotten a better sense for the strength of her prose if I had read the physical version. So I wish I could talk about that because this seems to be a thing that people really like about Wolf and I just don't know. <laughs> That is it for this wrap up. My battery is about to die, so I must close this quickly. Thank you guys very much for watching. Sorry, I have been rather bad about talking about the books I've read recently, but I am back on this horse. I'm not gonna go with that metaphor. I've never ridden a horse in my life, but there you go. That's what I read, and I'll be back to talk to you again in my next video very soon, and until then, bye.